thanks. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Books and Books. I'm Mitchell Kaplan, and I want to welcome you to what I know will be a very, very special evening. I also want to welcome all of the people who are watching outside of this room through live stream. We've been doing uh, live streaming with UA Media for the last year or so, and we have over 200 authors up on our website archive now. Uh, this event is being streamed live, and tomorrow morning, if you want to watch it over again, you're more than welcome to by just going to booksandbooks.com, and uh, this whole event will be uh, archived there as well. Uh, also, for those of you who are not uh, in the room right now, if you want to call the store, and the number is up on the screen, you can call the store and ask for a signed book, and we will make sure we get you one, and shipping will be free anywhere in the continental United States. So that's a pretty good offer, I think. Um, well, I also could not stand up here at all without uh, giving a little bit of a plug for what's coming up in about a week, which is the Miami Book Fair. That's all happening uh, starting this Sunday, and it runs for a full week from Sunday to Sunday. We have these fairgoer guides out there, and we have over 600 authors coming this year. Uh, everyone from... Uh, from um, my mind goes blank. From uh, Anne Rice to Patricia Cornwell to all of the National Book Award nominees uh, to uh, John Cleese. It's going to be a great, great fair, so we hope that you'll find out about it and come. But tonight is a very special night because I get to introduce uh, somebody who is an inspiration to me. And he's inspiration to me for a number of reasons. One reason is because I know... Uh, just how vibrant he is and all the remarkable things that he's still doing uh, at an age when many, many people don't do what he does. And I happen to know his age because he and my mother went to school together. So I know how old Ken is. And I am astonished that uh, Ken is an artist, he's a photographer, he's a sculptor, and he's also a teacher. Uh, I thought that what I would do, though, as by way of introduction, because I've introduced him in so many different ways, but I thought for some of you who don't know Ken, uh, I thought I would read, I came across in doing some research, the, um, the press release when Ken was uh, awarded the gold medal in 2013 from the AIA. And I thought I would just read a little bit of that to give you an idea of, of the accomplishments of this gentleman who's standing right here to my left. And I know he's walking away because he's embarrassed now. But uh, the Florida Association of the American Institute of Architects has named Kenneth Treister its 2013 gold medal recipient. The award is the highest individual honor bestowed by AIA and recognizes those who have made a profound impact on the architectural profession. Mr. Treister's activism in the community, passion for beautiful architecture, and dedicated to the profession has made an extraordinary impact in Florida for more than 50 years, said Peter W. Jones, AIA chair of the Florida Awards program. A Miami Beach native, Ken has spent a lifetime creating and writing on architecture. Treister is a sculptor and architect of Miami Beach's world-famous, soul-wrenching masterpiece, The Holocaust Memorial. He's also recognized for his work throughout the U.S., Israel, and the Caribbean. And in Miami, the Gumenik Chapel of Temple Israel, Mayfair, Office in the Grove, Yacht Harbor Condominium, and the restoration of Temple Emanuel on Miami Beach. He's also designed numerous private homes in the Miami area. He has lectured on architecture at universities in the U.S., Chile, China, Israel, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and Bali, as well as Carl Gables, to name just a few, and has written and produced four documentaries for national television about architecture. Just as a little sideline, when I was doing the research, Ken also has a listing in IMBD, which for any of you who know about film, it's the database for notable people in the film business. So he's got one of those as well. Uh, he's been published in more than 50 professional journals and has written nine books on architecture. And I have a few of them right here. He wrote really one of our best sellers in the store called Havana Forever, which is really kind of a beautiful, remarkable book on Havana architecture. He's also written this book by Martin Short. No, that's not true. Uh, he wrote another wonderful book on the, on the Bach Tower Gardens, which we have, um, and a book on Maya architecture. Um, 
Tonight, though, we know that he will be speaking about Easter Islands, uh, the Silent Sentinels, which is right here. And he's here with his two co-authors, and uh, Ken will be brought up, and then he'll introduce his two co-authors who will then speak to us tonight. So please give a warm, warm Carl Gables welcome to my friend and yours, Kenneth Treister. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Mitch. Mitch is a fantastic person. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I'm humble in, in his presence because he has this bookstore, which is difficult in the world to have a little bookstore. He has branches all over. He has restaurants, and uh, he has the book fair. And the reason I didn't want to be in the book fair, there's 600 authors in a book fair. Here I'm here by myself and two associates. It was an easy choice, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm happy that you're here. And I'm talking about one of our uh, great places, Easter Island. And I want to uh, tell you that in 1988, Helene and I went to Santiago, Chile, and I spoke to the University of Chile archaeology department, and Patricia, Claudio are associated, they're the deans of that department, and that's how we met. So that was the genesis of my interest on Easter Island, and it's flowered since, and luckily I have a good memory, and they have a good memory, so uh, I don't know, 30 years later or something, we did a book, on what we studied in 1988. So I'm going to introduce, uh, there's a wonderful thing of having co-authors, especially co-authors that know much more than you do about the subject. And they're the world's leading authorities on Easter Island. There's nobody in the world that knows more. And there's some people here that were on tours on Easter Island, and they're the ones that National Geographic uses, and uh, all the authorities in the world use their research on Easter Island. And it's a fantastic, beautiful island. If you can't be, if you can't go, it's not easy to get to. You can read the book and then you'll be there. So uh, I want to introduce uh, Patricia Vargas, who is uh, my co-author and a fabulous lady who I've, I, this book was not easy to write. Some books are easy to write. You do some photographs, a little text, and it's easy. This book was very, very difficult. I think we had in the uh, index, we had 27 pages of statistics. And then I would mention a conference, and someone would say, one of the uh, critics would say, what month was the conference? And what room was it in in that place? And Sam Berkowitz knows, when you have a scholarly book, it's not easy. So we had to make it entertaining and scholarly. And Claudio Cristino is her, my other co-author. And he has the advantage of living in Easter Island. So the two of them go back and forth, but they are from Santiago, Chile. And I want to introduce uh, Claudio first, and then Patricia, and then I'll talk. So let's give a big hand to uh, Claudio. Well, um, I must say that it's a great pleasure to be here uh, for many different reasons. Certainly the, the first one is that after so many years, we are being able to put together this book, which, as Ken said, you must read. It's my, it's my humble recommendation. And also, uh, it gave me the excuse to come to Florida after many years. I usually go to other parts of the US, like the East Coast, but I haven't been here for many years. And I have family here, and I can see many of them sitting here so my uncle is right there, and uh, it was, it's, it's so fantastic to be able to meet them again after you know, having seen them for so long. Uh, my duty tonight is, uh, besides just telling you that uh, uh, I recommend this book because I think that, as Ken said, uh, it was uh, extremely difficult to put it together, uh, will picture very well what we know at a certain stage of what happened on one of the most extraordinary places on this planet. A tiny island of only about 65 square miles uh, in the little corner of the southeast Pacific Ocean. And if you look at that image over there, uh, well, that's not necessarily uh, 
the vertical on top of Israel Island, those are the Hawaiian Islands, but that was taken from a satellite that it was called in those days, in the 80s, Galileo, and uh, the whole uh, image taken uh, by the satellite is just the Pacific Ocean, and you see two or three little specks of land. Uh, Israel Island is even more remote, and it was a scenario of one of the most uh, extraordinary you know, uh, developments uh, cultural developments uh, in the world. Easter Island is part of what we culturally call Polynesia, which is a huge region, the last territory that was conquered by Homo sapiens out of Africa in a process that has started around 100,000 years ago. And uh, what we see there, quickly after that, is that all the hundreds of islands that you see within that triangle, Hawaii at the north, Rapa Nui in the east or southeast, very close to South America, and New Zealand in the far south, is what we culturally call Polynesia. In those days, a thousand years ago, Easter Island was certainly, without doubt, the most isolated, inhabited spot of land in this planet. And as I mentioned before, the scenario of one of the most spectacular cultural developments ever imagined and ever known. Polynesians coming, well that's out of Africa, but Polynesians coming out of Southeast Asia in a process that started probably uh, about four or five millennia ago, eventually reached the coast of southern South America. East Island, as you can see, is right there. This extraordinary process of colonization of the largest geographical feature in the planet is by far, you know, one of the fates most remarkable of uh, humanity. What is even more significant is that after the island was discovered by a small group of people, maybe a couple of double canoes, as traditions say, uh, and found an island that was quite rich, but limited in resources, uh, cu were cut off the rest from the rest of the world for centuries. A couple of double canoes with uh, maybe 50 people, certainly less than 100 people, that eventually, in a few centuries, were able to develop you know, this extraordinary cultural which is certainly uh, well known worldwide today by the magnificent megalithic architecture and statuary that became icons of the modern uh, world of our society. Uh, this book deals with that long process. I wish I could, in 10 minutes, you know, summarize a thousand years of history, but certainly I cannot. But I just want to uh, uh, invite you to uh, read this book uh, and uh, visit this extraordinary place. Easter Island, and I will not talk about that because otherwise my uh, colleague here will, call, will, will kill me. That's her duty. Uh, you know, went from you know, this tiny group of people to the heights of you know, cultural evolution and uh, development and in that process, the uh, impact they had on their tiny, fragile environment was so great that eventually the whole system disintegrated. Well before the island was known to the Western world, which was the early 18th century, those great achievements and that sophisticated society that some people will equate with civilization was gone. And in many senses, uh, some other authors, archaeologists, sociologists, and other scientists, uh, use Easter Island as a sort of, you know, uh, comparison with what is, ha what is happening to our world today. In the sense that uh, what happened on Easter Island, as far as we know, which is, you know, summarized in this 
quite nice book is what we are doing with our planet today. So it's a lesson to be learned right there. Uh, some people go to uh, some uh, extremes saying, you know, well, these people disappear. No, they almost disappear. The whole system collapsed, declined, and because of contact, because of uh, disease introduced by Europeans for the most part in the 18th century, population also went down to about 111 people. Most of oral traditions, most of the meaning of all uh, these you know, symbols that you see there, these altars, these statues, and this very complex you know, archaeological landscape uh, could be only uh, interpreted from archaeology. We archaeologists like to say that you know, stones will speak to us. We try to extract information from these material remains, but to a certain limit, of course. And at the same time, one of my mentors of many years ago, when I was a student, used to say, Claudio, when you build a theoretical model, that model is built to prove what you want to prove. And if it doesn't work, you have to throw away, get new evidence, and build another one. And a great example of that is, for example, this. Now, this is a model. We have all these arrows tracing, you know, connection or possible connections or movements of people over thousands of years in the Pacific Ocean. Some of these, you know, roads, if you want, or connections were proven. Others were not. But there's no doubt, and that is also well discussed in this book, that they came from the west towards the east, north, and south in a process that took about 2,000 years, ending on Easter Island, and eventually even making no connection with South America. Uh, what can I add to this? Well, I could speak for hours about this, of course, but that's not the point. The thing is that we need to continue trying to explain what the connections were with other sections or areas or regions of this great Pacific Ocean. And uh, uh, what we are putting together in this book is just, you know, the, uh, not only the dry, uh, sometimes boring, hard data, but also a sound interpretation of all the evidence that is available. So we can say, without doubt, that Easter Island was settled from the west, not from the east, as for many, many years, decades actually, more than 50 years, uh, Heyerdahl, for example, the famous Norwegian explorer, claimed it was done from the east towards the west. So these extraordinary people is, at the same time, the culture that spread over the largest area in the planet. I could say many, many more things, but I have to give some time to my colleagues. So. Uh, I thank you very much for coming tonight, and I'd be glad to answer any question you might have later. Thank you very much. Well, it's working. Yeah, <laughs> closer. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, it's uh, our pleasure to have such an enthusiastic audience. Uh, the book that we're presenting, as uh, Ken was explaining, it took us many, many years to put it uh, together. Uh, fortunately, we had uh, internet. We were able to send back and forth the whole book, rewrite it several, uh, several times, and um, finally, we are all pleased with the result. Uh, what uh, is important about uh, this book is that we work really hard to make it something appealing for the general public. Because uh, many times, uh, you know, you have a, a lot of very real good archaeological data, but even for archaeologists, it's boring to read it. So how we were able to succeed, you know, in bringing real good evidence into some uh, kind of language that will speak from the heart from how we experience the island. 
And uh, for example, we talk here about the history. Uh, we go into the period in which the island was suffering. The islanders were suffering so much in, I in isolation. And they got to a point, as uh, Claudio was mentioning, from 15 southern people that probably were in the 16th century, they arrived to be 111 people in 1877. So most of the traditional history was almost lost because of that. And that brought a lot of mystery about Easter Island. Claudio and I, we arrived in 1976 to start working on Easter Island as archaeologists, anthropologists, working with the people. And uh, I think that we stay over 38 years now because not much was known about Easter Island. And it was so incredible that this tiny little island, during our surveys of the uh, different sections, we end up having 22 southern archaeological remains in our files. The island was totally covered by architecture remains, by sculpture. That's why we named the book, you know, Silent Sentinels. All those stones, all those incredible ceremonial sites and, and statues, they were all there like mute sentinels, you know, like people uh, will contemplate the, uh, the extraordinary uh, site as uh, the quarries with almost 400 statues. We spent recording the statues. We spent over a year trying in, in the late 70s, early 80s, trying to capture the real significance of being in a quarry where there were 400 statues uh, one that will that is over uh, 35 uh, feet tall, uh, that could have weighed uh, over 200 or 300 tons if it was finished. So it, it, we were dealing with really incredible pieces of art that meant something for the people in the past, and no one knew much how to explain what it really meant. So for many, many years, uh, People have uh, done uh, research on Easter Island, and uh, Claudio and I, we are the few people, I think, that ha have the privilege of being on site, working almost every day in the field, and uh, for over three decades. So part of the result of our long uh, experience on Easter Island is summarized in this, in this book. And uh, well, back going back to the history, uh, it, it is ex extraordinary, extraordinary to see how the statues at one moment that were raised on top of their platforms, they were all knocked down. How these people were surviving among the ruins of a very ancient culture. Uh, it is so impressive to see how today these ruins, these statues that are uh, 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 like guardians of, uh, of the island, how they have recovered meaning to the local people today, and, and uh, how they have attracted so many people to this tiny and remote island that today the whole economy of the island is based on uh, this uh, attraction that, uh, that, uh, that is uh, completely uh, linking Easter Island to the rest of the world. Um, all, the, all the sites were destroyed. The main uh, uh, ceremonial sites uh, were totally uh, vandalized during the prehistoric period. And there's one site that beyond being destroyed in the prehistoric period, was later destroyed by a tsunami in 1960. And our latest big project on the island was a crazy idea that happened in pretty much in the same time that a, a little bit later than when, when you visit, was the idea to restore a site that was, had 
been completely gone. And uh, we brought today a small video, seven minutes, that we want to share with you, that is showing the site that took five years of our life, and the site is well described also in, the, in, the, in one of the chapters of, of, of the book, and uh, how we finally were able to restore from the total devastation of this site to what you, s you will see in magnificent uh, photographs here to the, uh, the state in which it is today. And I think that uh, we don't want to run out of time. Ken also has to talk and he has other uh, thing to show. So I would like to share with you this uh, uh, short video that shows the, uh, our latest project. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Patricia. Now, uh, what you just saw was what they did in five years to rebuild one of the monuments in Easter Island, and there were hundreds. Those stones weigh thousands of tons. They're 50 feet tall in overall. It took them five years, a million dollars, and the finest equipment from Japan and from the world to do it. The Easter Island people did it without beast of burden, without knowledge, without history books, without colleges, without scientists, without equipment. They did it with the muscles on their back, and it's incredible. You saw what they did in five years. Can you imagine the height of civilization? The skill and organization that these people had was incredible. So I want to... Uh, just talk a little about the book, and then I want to show you a documentary that I did with Helene. Helene was my wardrobe <laughs> mistress. She, uh, she took care. I had to, in different scenes in the documentary, wear the same clothes. And over a month or two, you can't wear the same clothes, so I had to have several outfits. Helene made sure they were there. So every scene you see, it looks like I have the same outfit. It's really a different outfit. There's one place. I got to admit, you'll, well, I hate to tell you, where my shoes change from sneakers to leather, so I shouldn't tell you that. But the book is Easter Island Silent Sentinels. Uh, it was written by Claudio and Patricia and myself. But we have an introduction by Daniel Lipskin, who is the, one of the greatest living architects. And he did the Jewish Museum in Berlin. He did the, he's doing the Jewish Museum now in uh, Canada. He did the World Trade Center master plan and he wrote the uh the forward and he's a poet and he wrote when i got this uh, you'll read it in here but i just wanted to read to you uh on the forward here's what he says at the beginning now he's talking about an archaeological book he says the moai the moai are the, the giant statues the giant figures for which easter island is renowned are alive and breathing. Their large, upward-tilting noses inhale through their mass massive nostrils. Their disciplined horizontal mouth exhale as if they were ex exercising in an evil spill spell. On top of their heads are giant hats have been placed. Its heavy weight pushes them to the ground, lest they ascend in aerial bodies floating above the sky. They are dead inside the quarry but were brought to sacred life, created an acceptable comp compilation of passion. And he goes on and just calls in beautiful words and almost poetic this tremendous story of uh, these people. And then we're lucky, uh, we had some endorsements, but I wanted to share with you Jared Diamond, if you know, he's the one on television, the world expert on uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, Archaeology. He wrote the book Collapse, and he talks about the Maya collapse in Easter Island. And he says Easter Island is gigantic stone statues. It's Polynesian society, and that society collapse continue to fascinate and mystify the public, as well as scientists. This beautiful illustrated book is now the best current account of those riveting times. So Jared Diamond uh, was very kind, and there's other. Uh, endorsements. The one thing that's uh, very important to me was why the island collapsed. And it's a mystery. No one really knows the, ter ter the total story. But I have a theory which we talk about in the book that it collapsed because they were so good at sculpture. They were great sculptors. And they were so great that that was their demise. There had to be one reason. Now, they had all kinds of collapses, all kinds of secondary reasons. But they were so passionate 
about the success of them, of their statues. They were their gods, they were their ancestors, they were their passions, and they did it so well that they got completely consumed with their building. So they didn't worry about their continuation or adaptation or sustainability because they just loved this sculpture that they did. And so at the beginning we said, let's take a step back in time, a thousand years. On the shores of Easter Island, we see no Navy natives luxuriating among the palms, but busy people drawing, building, surveying, exploring the quarry for stone to which to carve a giant statue. We sense strong leadership, a strong worth, work ethic, cooperation and enthusiasm. We hear chiseling, singing, more chiseling. In the quarry, statues are released from their stone cradles to begin the procession across the island. The islanders literally walk the statues to their altars on the shore. And then one day, all activity stops. All the picks and the chisels drop to the ground, never to be taken up again. Statues in various stages of completion are abandoned in the quarry, never to take their first step. Others have just begun to be taken down from the hill to their volcanic nursery, never to join their siblings beside the sea. What happened? So we talk about, there's a whole chapter about the collapse of Easter Island, and there had to be one overriding, you know, there's disease and there's uh, uh, slavery and there's all kinds of things that happened to them, but this society became so fragile because it was overconsumed with building these beautiful statues. So I use that and I compare the collapse of the Maya. The Maya collapse was due to one thing, their love of architecture. They built such great cities in the Yucatan and in the Central America that one city wanted to be bigger than the next. One wanted to be grander. One king wanted to have a bigger one than the neighbor. Everybody built bigger and bigger till more than half the population was busy building instead of taking care of the civilization. And there's a parallel in the book Collapse by Jared Diamond where he said there's a problem with our civilization that we may be building ourselves into collapse. And so we talk about that in here. And then uh, we end and say, now the magnificent brooding statues of Easter Island are silent. Easter Island's architecture is now this great, this deserted. It's dark caves empty of noise or human life. But the island's fossil remains hold in their stone memories the spirit of a creative people who once embodied the vivid excitement of creativity. I got fascinated by the history of Easter Island. And it's a sad, sad story. So let me tell it to you very quickly. The civilization comes with a few people to this little desolate spot in this million mile of Pacific. And if you've ever been in the Atlantic or Pacific, it's scary, the vastness of it. So you got this little dot of an island. Here comes these few people, and they build an incredible civilization. Astronomy, mathematics, architecture, art, hieroglyphics. They do unbelievable statues. They build great architecture. Unbelievable, they didn't have universities. They had no one to copy, no books to read, no libraries like books or books. They do it by themselves. No human, re no resources, a, a very desolate island. And they build this magnificent civilization. And then it starts to crumble. The stresses are too great. So they start to, instead of building, every village built their statues, and then the next one says, well, I'm gonna build more than him. So they have three, we'll build four, and you just saw 15 statues. So everybody builds bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now what happens is they don't have any more resources to build anymore. Someone comes up with the idea, wait a minute, I can't build anymore to outdo my neighbor. I'm gonna tear down his statue, that'll show him. That guy says, wait a minute, he took down our statue, 
we'll show him. So they start destroying themselves. They go into cannibalism. They go into tribal warfare. Now the West comes and discovers this civilization in the beginning of collapse. So what happens? They bring uh, disease. They bring uh, Western civilization. And then there's a need for slavery in the world. And the African slaves are now diminished, so they decide to go to the Pacific to get slaves from the natives in the Pacific Islands. So slave hunters went to various islands, came to Easter Island. They would trick the natives. They would give them toys or candy or whatever, and they would get them to congregate, and they would take them on slave ships. So they decimate the population of Easter Island, and they took the king and some of the most trained of the masons that could do this work, and they take him to Peru to work in the haciendas as slaves. And so they then worked, and then there were some good-natured people who wanted them to come back. So there was a movement to bring back the slaves. So they brought back a remnant, took him to Tahiti, and they brought smallpox with them. So smallpox decimated them. So by the time the thousands who were taken in slavery got back to the island, there was a few hundred. Now, the Chilean government owns or takes control of Easter Island. And they decided, what are we going to do with this island in the middle of the Pacific? It's perfect for raising sheep. So they rent the island to an English sheep company and they decide what are we going to do with these few people they then put them in a little place in the island build a fence around it give the sheep the control of a whole island and take the few remaining survivors and fence them into a little enclave and they weren't allowed to go out of that enclave so it's one of the most heart-wrenching historic stories that you can read, and we, of course, talk the, the history in this book. So it's a positive story about a great civilization, and it's also a sad story of how they demise. Now, of course, with tourism and guides like Patricia and Claudia, it's now having a resurgence. And Patricia told me today it's the statues who worshipped, who they worshipped, who brought them good luck, now is the symbol in 2014 of a revival. People are interested, we're talking about it because of those statues of the gods. So in 1988, Helene and I went to Chile. Uh, I got interested. I did a documentary for uh, the Chilean government and uh, Claudia and Patricia helped. And so I wanna show you this documentary. So I was kidding the other day, I said, boy, the film looks old. I said, but I'm getting old, so I got old with the film. But this is a documentary, which you'll see now, on more or less the history and the culture of uh, Easter Island. And the lights. In the long history of mankind, only a few civilizations have achieved true greatness and reached the highest pinnacle of human accomplishment. One factor distinguishes each of these diverse cultures. The entire fabric of their society was a unified whole in which art and architecture were totally and completely integrated into every aspect of daily life. In this series, we will trace that single continuous thread from which has been woven the tapestry of civilization. exists in the midst of the great ocean, in a region where no one goes, a mysterious and isolated island. No other land is near it, 
and in all directions, empty and terrifying immensity surround it. The region of the Pacific, between America and Oceania, is itself larger than the Atlantic Ocean, the widest marine solitude, the most frightening desert extent of ocean there is in our world. In the center lies Easter Island, unique, a tiny pebble in the middle of the ocean. So wrote French explorer Pierre Loti in 1872. In the study of great civilizations, we find many that are splendid and grand, both in their history and their influence. But few excite the imagination with the astonishment and the mystery as that lonely volcanic dot in the Pacific called Easter Island was given its name by the Dutch who first discovered its existence on Easter Sunday, 1722. Here, a unique and wondrous culture flourished, expressing itself in a golden age that lasted nearly a thousand years. Today, that culture is extinct. Hundreds of gigantic stone sentinels guard its ragged lava coast, clothed only by the wind from the sea and animated by the birds that come to rest on this loneliest of islands. The civilization of Easter Island experienced a burst of glory unknown to the rest of the world. And then suddenly, for some unexplained reason, it fell silent and faded away. I'm Ken Treister, exploring with you that mysterious island in the center of the world. The shape and position of ruins often tell us a great deal about ancient societies. Here, all that remains is the fossil shell, its stone architecture and sculpture. Sometimes, with the study of these seemingly obscure cultures, we can find lessons relevant to our own civilization. It has been said that a great waterfall in the deepest jungle is silent if there's no one there to hear it. Is a civilization less remarkable when no one was there to observe it? Imagine a 60 square mile volcanic rock surrounded by a million square miles of desolate ocean, 1,100 miles from its nearest inhabited neighbor, Pitcairn Island, and more than 2,200 miles from the coast of Chile, its mother country for the last 100 years. Here, in the most isolated spot on Earth, on a volcanic rock as inhospitable as a moonscape, a people created a comprehensive stone architecture a well-organized and planned society, paved roads, observatories, an advanced hieroglyphic language, all culminating in the sculpting of giant, monolithic, living faces in stone. This island is veiled in a series of mysteries. Who are the first inhabitants, and how did they come to settle this tiny lost island? How did they not only survive unnourished by other civilizations, but create a magnificent art on this treeless, barren land. What motivated them to achieve the superhuman task of carving, moving, and erecting giant statues? Why did they suddenly and mysteriously topple those statues, destroying centuries of human effort? And why did the civilization then suddenly collapse? Let me give you a brief overview of Easter Island's history to set the context. Archaeological and anthropological evidence indicates prehistoric settlements by one culture of Polynesian origin arriving in a single migration, probably from the Marquesas Islands, about 400 AD. The initial 200 years of settlement was a period of acclimation, during which time the population multiplied rapidly and created a complex culture, which eventually encompassed the entire island. When the first settlers landed, they found a fertile island 
with flat rocky plains and a park-like savanna forest covering the hillside. They formed a stratified society based on lineal paternal descent from their first king, Hotu Matua. They organized into clans, each controlling a different territory. These zones extended from the coast to the center of the island, where there was a shared common area. The freshwater sources were found along the coast, and around these developed the clan villages, each focusing on a large communal plaza. In their complete isolation, the people of Easter Island believe themselves to be the sole possessors of the earth, its only inhabitants. This profound conviction led to a cult of ancestor worship, with its most dramatic symbol, these monumental stone statues. The heroic undertaking of sculpting these statues was based on the enormous pride of each clan and the fierce competition between tribal groups. Ultimately, more than 50% of the population contributed to the creation of these monuments at the expense of much needed food production. Even though resources were scarce and the ecology delicately balanced, the population swelled to nearly 15,000. Growth continued until it reached a point where more and more people were involved in building activity. The forest was consumed, the land became unproductive, and the entire system finally ceased to function. At this point, the workers may have rebelled against the rulers, and the golden age came to an end. This sudden collapse in the 17th century was marked by the abrupt cessation of this Herculean construction. The ensuing years of the 17th and 18th centuries witnessed savage intertribal wars and feuds, characterized by cannibalism and the toppling of a competing clan sculptures. The display of Western ideas and the arrival of Christian missionaries was further destabilizing, destroying old myths and traditions. In the 19th century, the population was decimated to only 111, first by Peruvian slave traders, then by smallpox. This severed our link of knowledge. All we know today is fragmentary, deduced from legend and runes. The focus of each clan's territory was an outdoor complex, which contained principally a large, unenclosed plaza or court in which the religious, political, and social life of the community occurred. Between this plaza and the sea, there was a raised platform or altar, which formed the base for the monumental statues carved out of volcanic tuff. Some of these altars, known as ahus, had as many as 15 statues, others as few as one. This platform had a vertical retaining wall on the seaside and a sloped inclined plane facing the plaza. These complexes were the masterpieces of Easter Island architecture, huge stages upon which life's drama was played. Though we are not certain of their sacred function, the ahus appear to have served as ceremonial platforms, sanctuaries, and funereal sites. These ceremonial plazas, which were the focal point of the clan's life, were often situated in pairs, flanking ragged inlets. On the main plaza was a circular stone dais on which the chief sat with his tribe gathered around him. Nearby was a raised stone platform where honored clansmen sat. In all the world, no prehistoric people ever built mammoth statues of this size and quantity. Their number, more than a thousand, sometimes exceeded the population of the island. The statues that were found fall into two groups, those in and around the quarry and those that were situated on the ceremonial platforms, their backs to the sea. The statues were the most important expression of the local culture and personified the founding chiefs and deified them as honored ancestors. They were all similar and stylized. And as a result of the intense competition, their size increased over time 
to as much as 60 feet in height, weighing 90 tons. Facing the communal plaza, these giant ancestral representations created a constant symbiotic relationship between the people and their predecessors. Once erected on the Ahu, the statues were brought to life with the insertion of shiny black and white eyes. These haunting orbs, most of which are now lost, were believed to endow the statues with supernatural powers. Some of the figures were adorned with cylinders of red scoria stone, which came from a second quarry and weighed up to 11 tons. Though some say they represent hats, they more likely represented the hairdo or top knot commonly worn on Easter Island and observed by the early European explorers. These early observers found an interesting anomaly among the islanders. Some had pure white skin and red hair. As these traits were held in high regard, the red stone top knot could represent ancestors of this special lineage. The stone figures had long heads, three-sevenths of their total height. The tops of their heads are flat, and the ears have elongated lobes almost to the chin. This fashion of elongating the earlobes was popular on Easter Island until the mid-19th century. This all-consuming passion for sculpture was fueled by the belief that the figures endowed the tribe with supernatural powers. Conversely, the pulling down of a neighboring tribe's statues diminished the adversary's power while enhancing one's own. It became easier to gain dominance over one's enemies by tearing down their statues than by creating new ones. Imagine the beehive of activities in the golden age. Hundreds of sculptors were chiseling stone in one quarry giant red headdresses in another, while a long line of statues crisscrossed the island on their way to their final sites, and still others strained at erecting them. It is a mystery still how without beast of burden, the wheel, or metal tools, they could carry these statues of 20 and 30 tons over such rugged terrain. Nearly 70 erect statues stand as silent sentinels protecting the sleeping ones still nestled in their cradles of stone. Almost all of the statues along the coast on ceremonial platforms came from this central quarry chosen for its special volcanic rock. Even today, it's spectacular to see the hundreds of sculptures in various phases of completion still attached to their mother rock. We find them in all positions in the most inaccessible places, in surprising numbers. After picking a suitable ledge, the carvers first sculpted the face, next the body and hands, and then the sides and finally the back. They used stone wedges to raise the statue after it was finally cut loose from its mother rock. And the statues were carved with hand-held stone mallets made of lapilli. To illustrate the enormous competitiveness of this civilization, we found one statue in the quarry almost finished that is 60 feet long, weighing approximately 300 tons. It is so gigantic that it may never have been intended to be moved. Around the slopes of the quarry, many statues still stand erect in the same position where they were finished and polished with abrasive volcanic stone. When all the statues at each tribal center were pulled over during periods of intra-tribal wars, those at this quarry were left standing, suggesting either that this was a sacred communal space or all that mattered was destroying the power of rival clans. When the cult of the predecessors with its stone images began to diminish, an intertribal warfare began. An old existing cult reemerged and became predominant as a rite of warriors. Known as the bird cult, it centered around the sacred city of Arango and these three rugged islands offshore.
With the scarcity of other animals, birds were the most interesting creatures on the island. They were a prime source of much needed food. They became the basis of this religious cult. Every spring, the servants of each clan's warrior chief swam to these islands to find and bring back the first egg of the yearly migrating birds. The victorious chief was made birdman for that year, the island's highest and most prestigious honor. After much religious and social rejoicing, the birdman, who had shaved his head, brows, and eyelashes, proceeded to the main volcanic quarry on the other side of the island, where he remained in seclusion for one year. Sexual initiation and homage to fertility were no doubt an important part of this cult, as many representations of sexual organs appear in the petroglyphs. This cult exemplified the period of stress, since bitterness and defeat and the insolence of the victors often led to warfare. The importance of the bird cult is demonstrated by the beautiful stone city created for its celebration at Orongo. This picturesque site, overlooking three islands, was occupied only during the annual ceremony and feast of the bird cult. One of the surprises of our study was the rich tradition of stone architecture and village planning, which has been unfairly eclipsed by the shadow of the more obvious giant stone statues. The most advanced design is the stone village here at the sacred city of Orongo. It is a lineal progression of 47 attached dwellings parading along the top of a thin ridge facing the sea. Each dwelling, made only for sleeping or eating, is generally elliptical in shape and is built of thick stone walls composed of thin slabs of rock set without mortar. The stone roofs were covered with a layer of dirt and grass, which not only added to insulation, but helped the structures to blend into the natural environment of the hillside. Architecture became part of the landscape. The roofs are supported by giant thin slabs of stone held in equilibrium by seemingly precarious cantilevers of stone, so that if one side were removed, the entire structure would collapse. The interiors are cool, dark, and comfortable. A perplexing mystery when one sees this exquisite permanent village is why, with these obvious skills, these prehistoric people did not build similar villages throughout the island. These people had six basic dwelling types. First the cave, then the pole structure of Polynesian origin, then the semi-subterranean structure, which this is an example, then the thatched house, then the communal dwelling, which was used to house guests during feast days, and finally the more permanent stone structures as those found at the sacred city of Orongo. Now they were all related, and since people lived primarily out of doors, they were used for sleeping and rain protection and form one continuous evolution of design and interior environment. The island's numerous subterranean caves were used in three ways, as permanent dwellings, as shelters for night fishing expeditions, and as refuge during war for losers whose villages were destroyed. Here we have the primary dwelling type, a thatched dwelling. And this particular one is elliptical in design and it's also called an inverted boat or a boathouse because it was like a shell of a boat. And because there was a lack of wood on the island, they developed this using small branches and twigs that were held into this foundation of cut stone and then bent across to form this inverted boat shape covered with a thatch made up of grass and uh, sugarcane leaves. Now in front was this beautiful patio, semicircular, and since they did all their activities outdoors, this is where they chatted and did their work. Now you entered this structure through a tunnel, sort of a funnel-like shape here, and you had to crawl on all fours to get in a two-foot opening, which gave them protection when they slept at night. Now the interiors were dark, gave protection from the wind and the rain, and I think made a very human family environment just for sleeping. 
Now, the amazing thing is that it's beautiful. The ellipse is very graceful, has a center axis, one entrance, and then this semicircular patio juxtaposition against this ellipse shows a very, very high degree of aesthetic appreciation and design, which shows that the elite were beautiful architects. We can still find the remnants of other architectural structures needed for the daily life of this society. For example, this stone structure was designed to protect the paper mulberry tree used for making clothing, as well as the banana trees from the strong Antarctic winds that whipped the island. Their food was primarily vegetal, and the sweet potato was the staple of their diet. At least 10 varieties still grow here. These stone catch basins, some simply hollowed out and others elaborately carved, were used to collect precious rainwater. We'll never know the whole truth of Easter Island's history. However, based on architectural and archeological remains, we can piece together a story of a rich civilization with a unique architecture, sculpture, hieroglyphics, and communal planning achieved in a hostile and isolated place. To obtain this success, a society needs leisure time to create its art, it needs artistic skills, the motivation and competitive spirit, an organization to manage this complex building activity, and finally, an intelligent elite to lead. Easter Island had these attributes. They came with a strong artistic heritage from the Polynesian culture and adapted to their geography effectively. Because of the lack of wood, navigation and fishing degenerated, and they relied on more stable agriculture. They used volcanic stone, which was plentiful, in a myriad of architectural forms for housing, agriculture, petroglyphic art, the construction of communal plazas, and monumental sculpture. And they did it all marvelously well. A lesson to be drawn is that cultures are not static, and they do not need external stimuli to develop a high degree of perfection. Their art is an example of the Polynesian genius, flowering in a bed of isolated stone. A second lesson, perhaps relevant to our society, concerns the sudden and mysterious collapse of this civilization. The tremendous building activity, so successful and wondrous, may have ultimately been fatal. The passion and success of their art engendered excessive pride and a fierce competitiveness, passing the point of ecological equilibrium, a lesson to be learned. Imagine that in one limitless expanse of the South Pacific, there exists a vast undersea world that erupted in one minute place. Here, a prehistoric people built on a series of volcanic craters, a unique civilization. It is still inhabited by the silent and mystical spirit of its creators who thought that this was the entire world. Though tiny and remote, Easter Island takes its place in the tapestry of civilization. Thank you. That's a younger guy. <laughs> Well, we want to thank we want to thank everybody. Let's give a big, big round of applause to everybody. It's great. That was Ken as Indiana Jones, I think. That's what that was. Uh, we want to thank all of you. Uh, the three authors will be available to have their book signed, but because there's so many in this room, we're going to do it in the other room, right across the uh, courtyard. When you rise, if you could fold your chair, if you're able to, and just put it against the wall, that'll make it easier for people to get out. Again, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Ken, for making this evening happen.